five orange pips by Arthur Cullen Doyle. I had glanced over my notes and records of Sherlock Holmes cases for the years of 82 and 90. My face was so many which present strange and interesting features. So it's no easy matter to know which to choose and which to leave. So I have a already grained public publicity for the papers and others have not offered a field for those particular qualities which my friend possessed in so high degree. Which is the object of these papers to illustrate? Some too have baffled his in, in, in analytic skill and will, and will be his narratives, beginnings without an ending, while others have been put partly cleared up. And have their explanation founded rather upon conjecture? Treasure and surmise that on the absolute logical proof which is so dear to him. There is ever one of these last which was so remarkable, its details are so startling, its results are intended to give some account of in spite of the fact that the, there are people, there are points of, in connection with which never have been and probably never will be entirely cleared up. The year 87 furnished us a long series of cases of greater or less interest. We shall retain the records. Among my headings, under this one twelve months, I found an account of the adventure of the Paradox Chamber of the Amateur Menacent Society, which held a luxurious club in the lower vault of the furnished warehouse. The facts can Connected with the loss of the British regret, Sophia Anderson, of the singular ventures of the Greece Petersons in the island of Euphra, and finally the Conwell poison case in the latter, as may be remembered. Sherlock Holmes was able to, by winding up the dead man's watch, to prove that he had been wound up two hours before, and that therefore the deceased had gone to bed within that time. A deduction which was one of the greatest importance in clearing up that up the case. All these I may sketch out for for some further date, future date, but none of them present such singular features as a strange train of circumstances which I have now taken up my pen to describe. It was the later days of September at cool glows of setting with exceptional violence. All day the wind had screamed and the rain had beaten against the windows, so even there, in the heart of the great handmade London, we were forced to raise our minds for the instant, for another routine of life, to recognise the presence of those great elemental forces with a shriek of mankind from the bars of civilization, like untamed beasts in a cage. As even drew him, the storm grew higher and louder, the wind cried and sobbed like a child in the chimney. Sherlock Holmes sat moodily at one side of the fireplace, crossing dancing the records of crime. I heard the other was deep in one of Clark Russell's fine sea stories, until the howls in the gate from about seemed to blend with the text and the splash of the rain, a lengthened out into a long swash of the sea waves. My wife was on a, a visit to her mother's, and for a few days I was a dweller once more in my old quarters at Baker Street. Why, said I, glancing up at my companion, that was surely the bell. Who would come to tonight? Some friend of yours, perhaps? Except yourself, I had none, he answered. I do discourage visitors. A client, then? If so, it's a serious case. Nothing less than would bring a man out on such a day and such an hour. But I take it, it that it's more likely to be some crony of the landlady's. So that Holmes was wrong in his conjecture. However, for there came a stop and a patches and a tapping at the door. He stretched out his long arm to turn the lamp away from himself and towards the vacant chair upon which a newcomer must sit. Come in, he said. The man who entered was young, some two and twenty, and the outside well groomed and trimly clad. With some refinement and delicacy in his bearing, the 
dreaming umbrella, which he held in his hand, the long, shiny old proof, told of the fierce weather through which he had come. He looked about him anxiously in the glare of the lamp, could see that his face was pale and his eyes heavy, like those of a man who was weighed down some great anxiety. I owe you an apology, he said, raising his golden princess is to his eyes. I trust I am not intruding. I fear that I brought some traces of the storm and rain to your snug chamber. Give me your coat and umbrella, said Holmes. You may rest here on the hook and be dry presently. You have come up for the southwest, I see. Yes, from Horsham. That clay and chalk mixture which I see in your toe caps is quite distinctive. I have come here. I have come for vice. That is easy got and help. That is always not as always so easy. I've heard of you, Miss Holmes. Miss Holmes heard of Major Pendergrass. How you saved him in the Tranquille Club scandal. Oh, of course, he's wrongly accused of cheating at cards. He said that you could solve anything. He said too much. That, that you've never beaten. I have never been. I have been beaten four times, three times by a man, men, and once by a woman. But that is that. Is, what is that compared with the number of your successes? It's true that I have been generally successful. And me, then you may be so with me. I beg that you draw your chair up and the fire and favour me with some details that all your case is no only one. None of these which come to me are. I am the last court of appeal. Yet a question, sir, whether all you, your spirits have ever listened to more mysterious and inexplicable chain events which have happened to my family. You feel me of interest, said Holmes. Pray give us in entire essential facts and commencement. I can afterwards question you to these details which seem to me to be most important. The young man pulled his chair up and pushed his wet feet out towards the bit please. My name, he said, is John Openshaw. But my own family affairs have, as far as I can understand, little to do with this awful business. It's a heresy man, sir. So to give you an idea of the facts, I must go back to the commencement of the affair. You must know that my grandfather had two sons, my uncle Elias and my father Joseph. My father is full small factory at commentary. He enlarged at the time the invention by Kissling. He had a painted theme of the open shore on break of tire. His business met with some success. He was able to sell it and retire upon a handsome compense. My uncle Elias emigrated to America. His young man became a planter in Florida, where he was reported to have done very well. At the time of the war, he fought in Jackson's army. Others under Hood, he rose to be colonel. When Lee laid down his arms, by him. my uncle returned to his plantation, where he remained for three or four years. About 1869 or 1970, came back to Europe and took a small estate in Sussex near Horsham. He made had made a very considerable fortune in the States. His reason for leaving them was his aversion to the Negroes, his dislike of the Republican Party. Extending the franchise to them. He was a single man, fierce and quick tempered, very foul mouthed when he was angry, and most retired disposition. During all the years he lived in Horsham, I doubt he ever met, set foot in the town. He was a, had gone two or three fields around his house, where he would take in his, ex, his exercise, though very often for weeks on end he would never leave his room. He drank a great deal of brandy and smoked very heavily, but he would see no society and did not want any friends, not even his own brother. He didn't mind me, in fact, he took a fancy to me. At a time when he saw me first, I was younger, I was a twelve or so. This was the year 1878. After he had been eight or nine years in England, he begged my father to let me live with him. He was very kind to me in a worse way. When he was sober, he used to be fond of playing backgammon and draughts for me. 
You make it, you represented both with servants and with the trans people. So by the time I was 16, I was quite the master house. I just kept all the keys and could go where I liked and do what I liked. So as long as I did not disturb his privacy. There was one single exception, however, for he had a single room, a lumber room up among the outer attics, which are very locked, which he found would never permit even me or anyone else to enter. With his boy's curiosity, a peep for the green hole, but he'd never, never be able to see more than such a collection of old trunks and bundles as would be expected in such a room. One day, his mark, in March 1883, a letter for a foreign stamp lay upon the table in front of the common plate. It was not a common thing for him to receive letters. His bills were paid, all paid in ready money. He had no friends of any sort. From India, he said he took up penetrary postmark. What well, can it be, this be? Opening a hurry, but out there jumped five little dried orange pips, which pattered down, down upon his plate. Going to laugh at this, but a laugh struck from my lips at the sight of his face. His lip had fallen, his eyes were protruding, his skin had colour purple putty. He glared at the envelope, which he still held in his trembling hand. <laughs> he shrieked. And then, my God, my God, my sins have overtaken me. What is it, Uncle? I cried. Death, said he, raising the table, he tied to his room, leaving the post. Palpitating with horror, me about leaving me palpitating with horror. I took up the envelope, the saw scored at the red ink upon the iron flap just above the gum. The letter K three times repeated. There was nothing else save the five dry pips. What could there be reason of his overpowering terror? I left the breakfast table, I ascended the stair, and met him coming down with the old rusty key, which must have belonged to the attic. In one hand, a small brass box, like a cash box. In the other, they may do what they like, but I checkmate them still. He, was, uh, he, he said he would know, tell Mary I shall want to fire my room today and send down to Fulham, um, the Holsham, Shum lawyer. I did as he ordered, and when the lawyer arrived, I was asked to step up to the room. Fire was burning brightly. The grate was a mass of black, puffy ashes. Of a burned paper, which a brass box stood open and empty beside it. As I glanced at the box, I noticed with a start, upon the lid was printed a treble K, okay, which I read in the morning, upon the envelope. I wish you, John, said my uncle, to witness my will. I leave my estate with all its advantages, and all its disadvantages to my brother, your father, whence he will, no doubt, descend to you. If you enjoy it in peace, I'm good. If you find you cannot, take my advice, my boy. Leave it, it to your deadest enemy. I'm sorry to give you such a dead walk thing. I don't can't say what turn things are going to take. Can you sign the paper where Mr. Thorman shows you? I signed the papers directed, and a lawyer took away from, it away from me. A single instant made me think the deepest impression upon me. I pondered over it. I turned it, it every way in my mind without being able to make anything of it. Yet I could not shake off the value, vague feeling of dread which I left behind. For the sensation grew less keen as the weeks passed and nothing happened to disturb the usual routine of our lives. I could see a change in my uncle, having drank more than ever. He was less inclined. They sought the society. This is his time he spent his room with the door locked upon the inside. So sometimes he emerged in a sort of jungle frenzy. He would burst out of the house and tear about the garden, revolver in his hand, screaming that he was not afraid of no man. He would not to be co- cooped up like a sheep in a pen by a man or devil. When these hot fits were over, however, he would rush tremendously in the door locked the door bar behind it behind him like a man who brazened it out no longer against the terror which lies at the roots of his soul. At such times have been seen have seen his face, even on a cold day, glisten with moisture, as though it had been only raised from the basin. 
I was to come to an end as a matter, Mr. Holmes, and not to abuse your patience. There came a night when he was made one of the most drunken sullies from which he never came back. He we found him when he went to search for him, face down in a little green scrummed bowl, lay at the foot of the garden, with no sign of any violence. The water was just two feet deep, so the jury would have been glad if he'd done his known infantry tree, brought to his verdict of suicide. I who only knew how he winced from the very thought of death, had much to do to persuade myself that he had gone out of his way to meet it. The matter passed over my father entered into possession of the state and some fourteen thousand pounds which lay in his credit at the bank. One moment, Mr Holmes interrupted, your statement I foresee one of the most remarkable to which I have never listened. Let me have the date of the reception by your uncle in a letter, a date as he supposed his suicide. The letter arrived on March 10th, 1883. His death was seven weeks later, upon the night of the May 2nd. Thank you, pay, proceed. When my father took over the Horsham property, he at my request made a careful examination of the attic, which had been always locked up. He found a brass box there, though its contents had been destroyed. Inside the covers of the paper label, the initials of KKK repeated upon it. The letters of Miranda, receipts in a British read beneath. There we presume, indicated the nature of the papers destroyed by Colonel Openshaw. For the rest, there was nothing of much importance in the attic, save a great many scattered papers and notebooks bearing upon my uncle's life in America. Some of them were the wartime and showed that he had done. He did he well and born the repute of a brave soldier. Others were date during the reconstruction of southern states with mostly concerned politics, for he would evidently, evidently take a strong part in opposing the carpet bag politicians who sent down from the north. At the beginning of eighty four, when my father came to lie and live in at the Holsham, Holsham and all went as well as possible with, with us until journey of eighty five. On the fourth day, New Year, I heard my father give a sharp cry of surprise. We sat together at the breakfast table. There he, there he was, sitting with a newly opened envelope, one hand and five dried orange pips, in the outstroked palm of the other one. He always laughed at what he called my cock and bull story about the colonel. But he looked very scared and puzzled now, and the same thing come upon him. Why, why, what on earth does this mean? Johnny murmured, stammered. My heart had turned to lead it. It's the KKK, said I. He looked at the envelope. So it is, he cried. Here are the very letters. But what is this written above them? The papers on his son, put the sun letters on the sundown. A red peeping over his shoulder. What papers? What sundown? he asked. Sundown in the garden. There is no other, said I, but the papers must be those that were are destroyed. Pooh, said he, gripping hard its courage. Here we are civilised land here. We don't have tomfoolery of this kind. What does this thing come from? From Dundee, I answered, glancing upon the postmark. Some purposeous practical joke, said he. What have I to do with some that... What? Have I to do with sundowns and papers? I shall take no notice of such nonsense. I should certainly speak to the police, I said. He laughed at my pains. Nothing of the sort. Then let me do so, for I forbid you. I won't have a fuss made about such nonsense. It is vain to argue with him, for he is a very obstruct man, obstinate man. I went about how the heart was full of foreboding. On the third day of the coming of the letter, my father went from the home to visit an old friend of his, Major Freebody, who is command of one of the forts upon Ports Downhill. And I was glad he could go, should go, for it seemed to me he was a father from danger, when he was far away from home. In that, however, I was an error. Upon the second day of his absence, I received a telegram from the Major imploring me to come at once. My father fallen over one of the deep chalk pits which abound in, in the neighbourhood. 
was very senseless with shattered skull. I hurried to him, but he passed away without seeing ever recorded his consciousness. He had, it appeared, been returning from Fulham. And Twilight and his country was unknown to him. A chalk pit unfenced. The jury had no hesitation in bringing in a verdict of death from accidental causes. Carefully as I examined each fact, every fact connected with his death, I was unable to find anything that could suggest the idea of murder. There were no signs of violence, no footstep marks, no robbery, no record of strangers ever being seen upon the road. And yet I could not need not tell you that, that my mind was far at ease, was well nigh certain that such foot foul plot had woven around him. In a sinister way it came into my inheritance. You may up. You will ask me why I did not dispose of it. I answer because I was well convinced that my our troubles were in some way dependent upon the incident, my uncle's life, the danger would be pressing in one house as it is in another. It was in January eighty five that my poor father met his end. Two years and eight months have elapsed since then. During that time I had lived happily at Belgium. I began to hope that this curse passed away from the family ended it from the last generation. I began to take comfort too soon, however. Yes, he won the blow fell. The very shape in which he had come upon my father. The young man took out from his face coat a common envelope. Turning to the table, he shook it about the bar. Upon it five little dried orange pips. <coughs> this is the envelope, he continued. The postmark is London, Eastern Division. Within the post, very words. This upon my father's Last message, KKK, then put the papers on the sundown. What have you done? Asked Holmes, nothing, nothing? To tell the truth, he sank his face into his thin white hands. I felt hopeless. I felt like one of those poor rabbits when a snake is wavering towards it. I seemed to be in the grasp of some riskless, riskless, inevitable evil which no foresight had precautions. And guard against. Tut tut, said her, quite home, Show Holmes. You must act, man. Or you, you are lost. Nothing but energy can save you. This is no time for despair. I have sent, I have seen the police. Ah, they listened to my story with a smile, convinced that Spectre was formed an opinion that letters are all a practical jokes, and that the deaths of my relations were really accidents, as the jury stated. Not to be connected with warnings. Holmes shook his head, clenched hands in the air. Incredibly imbecility, he cried. They have, however, allowed me a policeman who may remain in the house with me. Has he come with you tonight? No, his orders are stay in the house. Again, Holmes raved in the air. How did you come to me? He asked, said. Other than all, why did you not come at once? Did not know it was only day to day I spoke with Madam Major Pentecost about my troubles advised to him advised by him to come to you. You really two days since that letter. We should have acted before this. But you know further evidence, I suppose, that which you have placed upon before this. No suggested detail which might help us. There is one thing, said John Openshaw. He rummaged in his pocket, pocket and drawing out a piece of discoloured tinted paper, he laid it upon the table. I may have some remembrance, he said he. That on the day that my uncle burned the papers, I observed that small unburned margins, which lay amid the ashes, was a peculiar colour. I found this single sheet upon the floor of his room. I kind of think, maybe one of the papers, which his has perhaps fluttered out from among the others. In that way you escape destruction. Beyond the mention of pips, I do not see it helps so much. I think myself that this is page of some private priory, the writings of the doubtly of my uncles. Holmes moved the lamp. We both bent over the sheet of a paper which showed its ragged edge, and between... Indeed, from the torn from a pay book, it was headed March 1869. These are the following emmentical notices. Fourth, 
Hudson came, same old platform, seventh. Sent the pips on McCauley, McCauley, Padamore, and John Swan. Sent Gusty. Knight McCauley declared, cleared. John, tenth. John Swain cleared. Twelfth. Visited Padamore, all well. Thank you, said Mr. Said Holmes, folding up the paper, returning to our visitor. And now you must, you must on no account lose another instant. We cannot spare time to discuss what they told me. You must get home instantly and act. What shall I do? There is but one thing to do. It must be done at once. You must put this piece of paper you have shown us into the brass box which I have described. You must put in a note to say that all the papers were burnt by your uncle, and this is the only way which, one which remains. You must assert in such words as will carry conviction with them. Having done this, you must at once put the box upon the sundial. I directed, do you understand? Entirely. Do you not think of revenge or anything of the sort at present? I think we may gain that by means of law, we have a web to weave while there is already there is already woven. First consolation is to remove the pressing danger which fashions you. Second is to clear up the mystery and to punish the guilty parties. I thank you, said the young man, rising and putting up on his overcoat. You have given me fresh life, I hope. I will certainly do as you advise. Do not lose an instant, and above all, take care of yourself in the meantime. For I do not think you can be doubt, be doubt, a doubt that you are threatened by a very real and imminent danger. How do you go back? By train from Waterloo. If it is not yet nigh, the streets will be crowded. I trust that you may be in, sa- may be in safety, and yet you cannot guard yourself too closely. I am armed. That is well. Tomorrow I shall set to work upon your case. I shall see your ocean then. No, your secret lies in London. It is there I shall seek, shall seek it. I shall call upon you in a day or two days. And use it as a box and papers. I shall take your advice in very, in, in every peculiar. He shook hands with us and took his leave outside the wind. Still screamed and the rain splashed and pattered against the windows. This strange wild story seemed to have come to us amid the mid mad elements, blown in upon us like a sheet of seaweed in a gale, now to have been resolved by them once more. Sherlock Holmes sat some time in silence. His head sunk forward and his eyes bent over the red glow of the fire. He lit his pipe and leaning back to his chair, he watched the blue smoke rings as they chased each other up to the ceiling. I think, Watson, as he remarked at last, that it is one of all our cases. We have none more fantastic than this, save perhaps the throne of four. Well, yes, say perhaps that. And yet John Obershaw seems to me to be walking amid even greater perils than, than did the Sherlock's. But do you have, I asked, formed my de- any definite, but have you, I, f- I said, formed any definite conception to what these perils are? There can be no question to their nature, he answered. Then what are they? Who is the KKK? Why does he pursue this? Why does he pursue this unhappy family? Shall Holmes close his eyes, base his elbows upon the arms of the chair, and the fingers up, tips together, the other ideal reasoner, he remarked, would have not, when would when he had once again once been shown a single fact, all the bearings deduced from it, not only that all the chain events which led up to it, but also the results which could follow from it. As Calvia would correctly describe a whole animal by com- temptation for single bones, and Zelva, who has thoroughly understood one link in a series of incidents, to be able to be accurately state all the other ones, both before and after. We have not yet grasped the results which the reason alone can attain to. Problems may be solved in a study which have baffled all those who have sought a solution by either of their senses. The carry the art, however, is the highest pitch. It is necessary that the reasoner 
should be able to neutralize all the facts which have come to his knowledge, and it is in this itself applies, as you already see, a possession of all the knowledge, which, even to these days of free education and encyclopedias, is a somewhat rare accomplishment. It is not so impossible, however, that a man should possess all knowledge which is likely to be useful to him in his work. I have endeavoured in my case to do, to do, if I rather right, I remember rightly, you on one occasion in the early days of our friendship defied my limits in a very precise fashion. Yes, I answered laughingly, it's a single document, philosophy, astrology, politics, and marked to zero, at zero. I remember personally, very well, geology profound with regards to mints, mudstains, a really region with fifty miles of town, chemistry, eccentric, autonomy, atomy, and and, and somatic, sensation literature, and crime book was unique. Violin player, boxer, swordsman, lawyer, a self poisoner by cocaine and tobacco. And I think the main points of my analysis. Holmes grinned at the last item. Well, he said. I should say now that I have said then that a man should keep his little brain attic stocked with all the furniture that he's likely to use. Yes, he could away in a lumber room with his library. He can get it if he need, wants it. Now, for such a case as one which has been submitted to us tonight, we need certainly to muster all our resources. Can I hand me down the letter K of the American Encyclopedia, which stands upon the shelf upon beside you? Thank you. Now let us consider the situation and see what may we be reduced from it. In the first place, we may start with a strong presumption that Colonel Robinshaw had very, some very strong reasons for leaving America. Men at the time of life do not change all their habits, exchange willingly the charming climate, Florida for the lonely life, an English provincial town. Dream of the solitude in England suggests the idea is a fear of someone or something. We also, we may all presume, the working hypothesis is fear of someone or something that drove him from America. As what he was feared, we can only deduce by considering the formal letters which we received by himself, his successors. Did you mark the postmarks of these letters? The first was from Penchury, the second from Dundee, and the third from London, from East London. Do you what do you do from that? They're all sequels. Then the writer was on board a sh- of a ship. Excellent. We have already a clue. And we no doubt that the probability, a strong probability, is that a writer on board of a ship. Now let us consider another point. The case of Prenotary. Seven weeks elapsed between the threat and its fulfilment. And the D is only three or four days. Does that suggest anything? A greater distance of travel. But a letter had also greater distance to come. I do not see the point. The least presumption of vessel in which a man or men on it is a sailing ship. It looks as they must always send their single warning or token before them then starting upon their mission. You see, you see how quickly the deed followed a sign when it came from Dundee. Is it if they had come from Prenatory and the steamer, they would arrive almost as soon as they had written the letter? But in matter of fact, several weeks elapsed. I think that those seven weeks represented the difference between the mail boat and brought the letter and the sailing vessel, which brought the writer. It is possible. More than that, it's probable. And now you see the deadly urgency of this new case. And why I urge young Openshaw to caution? The blow has always fallen at the end of the time. It would take the senders of travel a distance, but if one comes from London, therefore he cannot count upon delay. Good God, I replied. What can it mean? It's relentless persecution. Now, the papers from open, which Openshaw carried are obviously of that importance to person, persons in a sailing ship. I think it's quite clear that there must be more than one of them. A single man could not have carried out two deaths in such a way to see the coroner's a quiet jury. There must have been several in it. There must may have been men of resource and determination. The papers they meant to have behold of them, who it may. In this way, you see KKK creases to, ceases to the initials of an individual and becomes a badge of a society.
But with what society? Have you ever, said Sir Holmes, bending forward and sinking his voice, have you ever heard of Ku Klux Klan? I have never. Holmes turned over the leaves of a book upon his knee. Here it is, said he precisely. Ku Klux Klan, a name derived from a fanciful resemblance to the sound produced by cocking a rifle. A terrible secret society was formed by some ex Confederate soldiers in southern states after the Civil War. It rapidly formed in local branches in different parts of the country. Lovely Tennessee, Louisa, canalized Georgia and Florida. It powers the use for political purposes, principally for terrorizing the Negro voters and murdering and driving them, driving the country of those opposed to its view in the rages were usually preceded by warnings sent to the marked man in some fantastic but generally recognized shape, a sprig of orange leaves in some parts, mellowed seeds or orange pits in others. We're seeing this, the victim might either openly procure in foreign ways, or might fly from the country if he braved the matter out deathwards and fully lead come upon him, and usually in some strange and obscene manner. So perfect was the organization of society, so somatic in its methods, there is hardly a case upon record where any man succeeded in braving it from impunity, in which any of its outrages were traced home to perpetrators. For some years, the organization flourished in spite of the efforts of the United States government and beta classes of community in the South. Eventually, in the year 1869, the movement rather suddenly collapsed because although there have been somatic, sporadic outbreaks, same some sort, since that date. You observe, said Holmes, laying down the volume, that a sudden breaking up the society was consequent. The spirits of open shore from America with his pa- with their papers. It may well have been the cause and effect. It's no wonder he and his family some of the most impassable spirits upon their track. You can understand that his register, a diary, may implicate some of the first men in the South. There were there may be many who will not sleep lazy at night till it is recovered. Then a page we have seen is such we must suspect it ran, if I remember right, send the pips to A, B, and C. That is, send the society warning to them. There's successive entries, and then A and B cleared, or left the country, and finally C was, visit, was, visit, was visited, by fear of sinister result for C. Well, I think, Doctor, that we may let some light in this dark place, leave the only chance. Young Openshaw has, in the meantime, is to do what I have told him. There's nothing more to be said to be done tonight. So hand over my violin and let us try to forget oh, for half an hour the invisible weather and still more miserable ways of our fellow man. A clear and morning, the sun was shining, with stewed brightness through the dim veil which hangs over the great city. Sherlock Holmes was already at breakfast when I came down. Oh. Excuse me for wait, not waiting for you, he said. I have foreseen a very busy day before me. Looking into this case of young open shores, what steps will you take, I asked. It will be very much depend upon the results of my first quarries. I may have to go down to Horsham after all. You will not go You will not go there first? No, I shall commence from the this, this, from this city. Does ring the bell and the maid will bring you up your coffee. As I waited, I lifted an open newspaper. The table glanced my eye over it, wrested down a heading which sent a chill to, to my heart. Holmes, I cried, you are too late. Oh, he said, coming down with his cup. I feared as much. How is it done? He kind of spoke calmly. But I could see he was deeply moved. When I caught the name of Openshaw on the heading, Tragedy near Waterloo Bridge. Here's the account. Between nine and ten last night, police constable cook of H Division, a duty near Waterbridge, Waterloo Bridge, had a cry of help, a splash in the water. The night, however, was extremely dark and stormy, so that despite the help of the purple passers by, it was quite impossible to effect a rescue. Alarm, however, was given, and by the aid of the water police, the body was eventually recovered. It proved to be that of a young gentleman whose name 
It appears from an envelope which was found in his pocket with John Openshaw. His residence is near Holmshaw. 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 Conjectured he may have been hurrying down to catch the last train from Waterloo Station. In his taste and stream darkness, he may have passed Mrs. Path and walked over the edge on a small land in places of the river for river sailing boats. The body is exhibited no traces of violence. Can be no doubt that the deceased had been the victim of a fortunate incident, which should have, which should have the effect of calling attention to authorities to the condition of the riverside landing places. Dages. He sat in silence for over some minutes. For Holmes, more depressed and shaken than I have ever seen him. That hurts my pride, Watson, he said at last. It's pretty feeling, pretty feeling. Petty feeling, so no doubt. But it hurts my pride. It becomes a personal matter for me now. If God sends me health, I shall send my hand upon this gang. And they should come to me for help. But he should come to me for help, and I should send him away to his death. He sprang from his chair and paced the room in a controlled agitation. A flush upon his shadow cheeks. Another's clasping and unclasping his long, thin hands. They must be cunning devils, he exclaimed at last. How could they have destroyed him down here, there? The apartment is not in a direct line to the station. The bridge, no doubt, is too crowded, even on such a night, for their purpose. Well, Watson, we shall see who will win in the long run. I'm going out now to the police. No, I shall be on my own, my own police. When I should spun the web, would take the flies, but not before. All day he was engaged in personal work. Late in the evening, before he returned to Baker Street, Sherlock Holmes had not come back yet. It was nearly ten o'clock before he entered. Looking at pale and worn, he walked up to the sideboard, taking a piece of loaf he devoured voraciously, wishing it down with a long draught of water. Are you hungry, Mark? Starving. You escaped my memory. And nothing since breakfast. Nothing? Not a bite. I had no time to think of it. And now, have, have you been successful succeeded? Well, you have a clue? I have them in my hollow of my hand. Young Obishaw will not long remain unvenged. Why, right, Watson, let us put our own devilish trademark upon them. It is as well thought of. What do you mean? He took an orange from the new cupboard. A tearing it into pieces, he squeezed at the pits on the table. On his table, he, uh, out of these, he took five and thrust them into the envelope. On the inside of the flap, he wrote S-H for J-O. He sealed it and addressed it to Captain James Collan, Barclay Lone Store, Savannah, Georgia. That will wait, that will wait him when he enters port, he said, chuckling. He'll give him a sleepless night. You find as much such a persecutor his late fate as Openshaw did before him. And who is Captain Cojone? Cone, leader of the gang. I shall have the others, but he's first. How did you trace it, then? He took out a large sheet of paper from his pocket, all covered with dates and names. I have spent the whole day, said he, over Lloyd's registers and files of old papers, and following the third career of every vessel, a touch of Ponotary, in Germany in February of 1983, it was 36 ships of fair tonnage and who ported it during these months of these. One was a lone star, instantly attracted my attention, since the moment it was ported as having cleared from London, meaning that which is given was one of the states of the Union, Texas, I think. I'm not, I'm not sure which. I knew that ship must have been American origin. What then? I searched the Dundee records. I found the barbecue laid at the star was there in January 85. The suspicion, come with certainty, I had acquired as a vet to the vessel who lay a present at the port of London. Yes. I said, right arrived there. Here's last week. I went down to the open dock and found that she had been put, taken down the river by the early tide. This morning, homeward bound to Savannah. I arrived at Ways Inn and learned that she passed some time ago. Wind is easterly. I have no doubt that she didn't pass the good winds, and not far from the Isle of Wight. What would we do? What will you do then? 
Ah, I have thrown my hand upon him. <coughs> he and his two men, as I learned, only Native Amer- born Americans, a ship as well as a Finn and Germans. I know also they were all three away from the ship last night. I had from the seventh law been loading the cargo by the time the sailing ship which is the mail boat who carried this letter. Cable will be informed to the police of Vanna. The three gentlemen are badly wanted upon a charge of murder. There is ever a flaw, however. The best laid of human plans, the murder of John Obishaw, was never to see the old pits, which showed them that the other, as cunning as the themselves, upon their track. Very long and very severe were the ad called girls that were at you. Waited long for news of Lone Star Savannah, but never, but it never reached us. We did at last hear that somewhere, near, far out the Atlantic's shattered up stern post, a boat was seen swinging in a trough of wave with the letters LS carved upon it. And about, and that is all which we have, shall ever know of the fate of the Lone Star.